Hi, I'm Lori Peterson, editor of Whole Foods Magazine. Welcome to our webinar on the science of carb control for weight management and fat loss. With childhood and adult obesity rates higher than they were a generation ago, we believe it's important to understand how weight can be managed to help avoid developing conditions such as heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, or diabetes. We're lucky to have with us today Dr. Ralph Yeager, a world-class inventor of functional foods and dietary supplements. Dr. Yeager is an expert in probiotics and sports nutrition. He has written numerous peer-reviewed scientific papers on weight management, sports nutrition, brain, joint, heart, and gut health. Dr. Yeager studied at the California Institute of Technology and the University of Bonn. He is a senior scientific advisor to Pharmachem Labs, the manufacturer of phase two carb control. We thank our partner Pharmachem Labs for bringing this important information to you. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay in the retail content library at wholefoodsmagazine.com. All mics have been muted for this presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Yeager, please type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. Dr. Yeager will answer questions at the conclusion of his presentation. And now I hand it to you, Dr. Ralph Yeager. Uh, thank you, Larry, for the introduction and your kind words. It's a true pleasure to be able to talk about the science of carb control for weight management and uh, fat loss. I'm truly excited to be able to talk about one of my favorite ingredients, and that's phase two. I will start this presentation with a brief video introducing you to the concept of weight management through carb control. Some weight loss products may claim that are outrageous. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up and witness the impossible. roller coaster and on to something that's proven to work and built to last. Phase 2 Carb Controller, the original white kidney bean extract carb blocker. Backed by years of R&D and over a dozen clinical studies, Phase 2 is safe, natural, and totally effective. When taken before a meal, Phase 2 can significantly reduce the absorption of calories from carb-rich foods like bread, potatoes, rice, and pasta up to 66%. In fact, phase two is the only weight loss ingredient with sufficient data to support multiple structure function claims, protecting you. No other weight loss ingredient can say the same. Plus, phase two is safe and pure, so it can be used with the utmost confidence. Best of all, consumers want phase two. In a Harris poll, over 45% of the respondents who take dietary supplements said they would try phase two. The same poll revealed that consumer awareness is generally low, and that's the opportunity. A recent study revealed that people who used phase two lost weight, kept the weight off, and improved their mood. Consumers who know about phase two want phase two. You can use phase two in capsules, tablets, gummies, soft chews, flavored water, iced tea and coffee, water enhancers, powdered drinks, functional seasoning and enhanced your medical food. And we build your brand using consumer media relations, TV and radio appearances, digital marketing, and social media. We even help with your point of sale materials, content, staff training, and more. So no more circuit tricks, no more fads. Make phase two your next star attraction. The most reliable, safe, and effective weight loss performer, phase two. Enjoy a little more, absorb a lot less. When I was looking up the data to prepare the slides for this talk, I was actually blown away by the fact that obesity has taken the place of hunger as the number one global health crisis. Obesity is now killing three times as many people as malnutrition. In America, two-thirds of the adults are overweight, and roughly one-third of Americans are actually obese. Obesity puts a financial strain on the healthcare system as medical costs for obese people 
are roughly $1,400 higher than those of normal weight. And according to Duke University and other sources, the outlook actually is not uh, that good either, because right now it's estimated that 42% of Americans will be obese by the year 2030. So this is a growing problem. When we're looking at obesity prevalence in 2016, so last year, we actually uh, can see that the, the obesity prevalence varies across states and territories. One important fact is that no state had a prevalence of less than 20%. So every state, at least 20% of obese people. 35% or more adults actually had obesity in five different states. And we're looking at the different territories. The South and the Midwest has more obese people than the Northeast or the West. When we're looking at the obesity rates by race and gender, uh, what is significant is that the uh, obesity rate in Asian Americans is significantly lower and the obesity rate in uh, black women actually significantly higher. A more growing issue actually is the obesity rate in children, so children ages 2 to 19. And as of today, 23.9 million children are actually overweight or obese. We can actually see that the obesity rates increase from preschool to school to adolescence. And actually there are no differences between males and females. So childhood obesity is a very fast growing, big health concern for our society. When we're looking at the growth rates, we can actually see comparing 2000 to 2014 is that the number, uh, the percentage of people with obesity has been growing significantly from 30.5% in 2000 to 37.7% in 2014. And the same growth actually can be seen in youth from 13.9% to 17.2%. So what we actually see is a significant growth in obesity over the years. The top three killing diseases have strong and direct connections to being overweight. That's heart disease and stroke, cancer, COPD. And also osteoarthritis, the top debilitating disease, has a direct link to being overweight or being obese because the additional weight puts additional strain on our joints and therefore overweight and obese actually increases the rate of osteoarthritis. The big question is actually how do we get here? When we're taking a look at the historic development, we obviously can see that in the 80s, uh, things were uh, not problematic at all. But uh, with time, actually, the uh, obesity and overweight uh, rates dramatically increased. And the reason why we would like to understand of what happened is because if we know exactly what happened, maybe we're able to reverse some of the things or at least uh, put them uh, to a stop, making sure that the obesity doesn't further increase. So therefore, it's important to understand why actually this development has happened. And uh, the next thing I would like to do is take a quick trip with the time travel dietitian. chance yet to um, take a look at the complete video I can highly recommend that uh, Google the, the time travel dietitian it's, uh, it's a very nice uh, review of the different uh, recommendations uh, that actually have been made uh, through the years and also shows you the implications and obviously the implication of the recommendation is uh, what we're talking about right now so when in the late 1970s uh, we recommended that people should be on a low fat diet at that point, people were concerned about high-fat diets and the increased risk of heart attack and stroke. 
and uh, learning more about cholesterol and how cholesterol is a risk factor for actually developing heart disease. Uh, if you're looking at the graph, actually the purple line are uh, the age group from 18 to 29. The blue one is 30 to 44. The dark blue one is 45 to 64. And the green line actually are people of 65 years and older. And what you can see from the graph is that uh, starting at the late 70s, we see a significant increase in obesity uh, because when we started taking out the fat out of foods, uh, obviously uh, companies had to replace fat because fat is one major contributor to taste. So in order for the low-fat foods to still taste good, they had to do one or the other thing, either increase the amount of salt in the food, or they actually compensated by the addition of carbohydrates to the food because carbohydrate is an, another major contributor to the taste. So low fat actually means that there are more and more carbohydrates in our diet. And the next slide here actually shows uh, that also uh, uh, very effectively. Uh, last year, uh, the average American consumed 153 pounds of sugar. And these days, actually, sugar is added to almost everything. And the main reason why it's added to the food actually is because it tastes better. And obviously, if it tastes better, people buy more. So the companies are making more money by actually enriching uh, their products with the sugar. What also has changed is basically where we eat. Uh, home cooking uh, was a long time ago. If we're looking now at the numbers, actually uh, eating away from home and fast food uh, makes up 50% of the food sales. And eating healthy while on the road is extremely difficult. It's obviously easier to just grab some fast food, uh, specifically if you're traveling. Uh, and obviously, that overall has uh, changed. Uh, we're no longer eating most of our foods at home. And that uh, exposes us to also uh, a lot of processed foods, and a lot of foods that are enriched uh, with carbohydrates. Other reasons? while we actually see an increase in, in, in obesity is that the portion sizes dramatically increase. And with the portion sizes getting bigger, obviously the caloric intake has significantly increased. And if you're taking a look at this slide, you can actually see what the burger fry and the soda looked like in the 1960s and how it looks like today. We see that we're getting 250% uh, more calories from the fries uh, 450 more calories from the burger and up to 500 calories more from our soda. Meaning that uh, while basically eating the same meal, uh, uh, yeah, burger and fries and soda, uh, all of a sudden uh, the caloric in intake has significantly increased. And uh, that trend, obviously, a lot of uh, agencies are trying to, to fight that. And there's a lot of education going on. Uh, on educating people on actually what the appropriate portion size should be. And uh, on the slide on the upper right, you can actually see the hand guide to portion control, which again teaches people on actually what portions should look like. Other than basically increasing portion size and, and therefore increasing caloric intake, what also has happened at the same time is that the physical activity has significantly decreased. The recommendation is that we should go out and be active for 60 minutes. That's moderate to uh, vigorous intensity uh, activities, running, cycling, uh, chasing your kids down the block, whatever you like to do, walking the dog a little faster. So 60 minutes of that should everyone do. But uh, what we actually see is that, that only 20% uh, of the children, and the numbers for grown are not that different, actually get the recommended amount of exercise. So sitting is the new smoking meaning we have to get out and we have to overcome that and, and teach our kids again to put down that cell phone and uh, not play video games, but go out and, and go and play. So therefore, 60 minutes of exercise, everyone should do that. But again, most people actually don't get that amount. So that's another thing that we have to educate, the, uh, specifically our children against go and play. Another trend that actually happened is that life expectancy increases, which obviously is a good thing. We're all going to live longer. Just in the last 15 years alone, life expectancy increased by five years. What happens when we get older? Actually, a lot of uh, negative things are going to happen because, for example, age-related cognitive decline. We reach the peak of our mental capabilities at the age of 25, and from that point on, we always lose a little bit. And usually it starts with us not remembering where we put the keys when we came home, 
Uh, trust me, when you're 18, you know exactly where you put those keys. So age-related cognitive decline is an issue. We have more on the tear on the joints, so osteoarthritis is becoming an issue. Uh, we're losing our eyesight when we're aging. And, and one very important thing, actually, is that we're losing muscle mass. And the average person loses between 3 to 5% of muscle mass every 10 years. And the rate of muscle loss actually is accelerating while we age. Uh, the process usually starts around uh, uh, 30 years of age and obviously uh, continues on, on, until the day we die. When we're looking at a healthy body composition, when we're young, 40% of our overall body mass actually is muscle. And that is important because muscle is a very metabolically active tissue, meaning we are burning calories having muscle. And on the right, you see actually what happens after 60 years of muscle loss, only 24% of the body mass is now muscle, meaning that we are naturally burning less calories and we would actually have to adjust it by actually eating less. What is happening actually is something that's called sarcopenic obesity, and that actually is a loss of muscle mass, while we at the same time increase fat mass. And we're losing roughly 30 to 40 percent of muscle mass and 20 to 40 percent of strength between the ages of 20 to 80. And in this graph, actually, you see a person that uh, over his lifespan from 25 to 75 years of age was perfectly capable of keeping his body weight stable which is really impressive and really rare and really good. However, what actually happened at the same time is that the person increased body fat. So you lost muscle mass and you increased body fat. So that's what's called sarcopenic obesity. Let's take a look at the carbohydrates. And now basically we walk through the reasons of why we see a dramatic increase in obesity rates. Now let's take a look at the carbs again. And we have three different carbohydrates. We have fibers starch, and sugar. And sugar is a simple carbohydrate that can be easily absorbed. And once they actually are absorbed, two things can happen to them. They're either going to be used for energy or they're going to be stored as fat. Starch is actually complex carbohydrates that cannot be absorbed unless they're first broken down by enzymes. The enzymes are chopping them down and then they can be absorbed. Foods that are starchy include the grains, potatoes, corn, peas, uh, uh, winter squash, but also processed uh, foods like a pasta or bread are rich in starch. So during the digestion, actually, the starch is broken down by an enzyme that's called amylase. Amylase is basically the digestive enzyme. You see a little pair of scissors there that is cutting down the, 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 uh, the bonds between the different uh, sugar molecules and breaks it down into simple sugars, into glucose and fructose. And once the starch is broken down into glucose and fructose, uh, those uh, sugars are then readily absorbed, and then again, the same fate. Either they can be used immediately for energy, or they're going to be stored as fat. What we obviously know is, in order to uh, prevent increases in, in, in weight, uh, the best way, basically, is to reduce caloric intake and specifically reducing uh, carbohydrate intake. But compliance uh, to a low-carb diet is really difficult because what happens is that, that people in a low-carb diet, diet actually get really grumpy. They're not going to be happy people. And one solution to this problem is that we want to reduce carbs, but actually it's difficult to do is to add a phase two to your diet, an all-natural white kidney bean extract that actually is capable of uh, inhibiting the amylase activity, meaning it prevents the breakdown of starch into simple sugars. And here's another video that basically uh, quickly shows you how exactly uh, phase two works. Pasta, beans, potatoes, rice, bread. How to enjoy these great foods and not worry about calories? Let's take the phase two test. Two beakers. We're adding starch solution to plain water in both. Now, only to the beaker on the right, we add phase two. In both beakers, we add alpha amylase, the enzyme in your body that reduces carbohydrates to simple sugar. Without alpha amylase, the carbohydrates are not broken down and not absorbed by the body. They pass through your system instead, preventing the absorption of calories. 
these two blocks our families from breaking down the carbohydrates. Now to both beakers. Identical amounts of iodine. Watch. The iodine will turn dark purple in the presence of starch, but won't change if the carbohydrate has been broken down into sugar. D. The solution on the left, without phase 2, does not change color. The carbohydrate has been broken down into sugars. These sugars can be absorbed by your body. The solution on the right, with phase 2, stays purple. The starch has not been broken down and cannot be completely absorbed by your body. The result for you and your body, the pleasure of all these great foods with fewer calories. Phase 2. Test it for yourself and see. So let's take a look at the clinical data. Obviously, the, the theory is good, and now we have to actually take a look at actually uh, if this can be translated into real life situations, meaning that if we're really consuming uh, foods, with phase two, does it really reduce the amount of uh, glucose that's being absorbed from those foods? And this study actually looked at the effects of the addition of phase two to the consumption of four slices of white bread with the margarine. And the outcome of the study actually is that the addition of phase two reduced the amount of uh, carbohydrates that are being absorbed, the glucose being absorbed by two thirds. So 66% less absorption if you're adding phase two to uh, the white bread. And again, the, the mechanism behind that is that phase two blocks the enzyme that breaks down the starches. To visualize the effect a little better, actually, if you're sitting at your breakfast table and you're having three slices of white bread, uh, actually the three slices of white bread uh, when we're looking at the absorption of glucose is only worth one slice of white bread meaning you're getting the same amount of glucose uh, from uh, in your system as you would consume only one. So you can eat three, but you're only absorbing one. More important, obviously, is, uh, okay, we're getting less uh, sugar, uh, less uh, uh, glucose into the system. As a consequence, if we're absorbing less carbohydrates, we're absorbing less calories. So if we're adding phase two to a diet in the long run, we should see a reduction in body weight and a reduction in body fat. And hopefully we can actually see that we're maintaining our lean body mass, our muscle mass. And I will present now a couple of studies as examples of actually what phase two can do if you're adding it to a diet. The first study actually looked at the consumption of phase two for 30 days and the phase two was consumed before a carb-rich meal. And the subjects uh, who were overweight in the study actually were put on uh, a calorie, uh, maximum calorie amount of 2,000 to 2,200 calories. It was slightly calorie deficient. The outcome of the study actually is if you're adding phase two, uh, the subjects actually lost 5.8 pounds more body weight. So significant loss of body weight in just 30 days. Very important is then the subjects actually lost 4.9 pounds of body fat, meaning that most of the loss of body weight actually is fat. And in addition, you see a significant improvement in, in body composition. So important message is, yes, if you're actually adding phase two to a diet, you're controlling the calories they're consuming, then actually you're going to lose weight, and the weight you're going to lose actually will be fat, and it's most important you're maintaining your lean body mass because what usually happens is that once you're done with your diet, people usually go back to uh, the diet that they originally had, the diet that actually got them into trouble. Uh, obviously, in the perfect world, we would like people to make really lifestyle changes that, and they really change the diet in the long run. They're going to be more physically active and they're actually going to eat healthy in the long run. But most people, unfortunately, slip back to their old habits. And then the so-called yo-yo effect is going to happen, meaning that they will regain usually the weight that they lost. And they will not only regain the weight, they usually gain a little more than they had before. And one of the reasons, actually, is that if you're doing the wrong diet, you're losing muscle mass. If you have less muscle mass, you have less metabolic tissue, meaning you, on a daily basis, are using less calories. 
Now, if you're going back to the same amount of calories that you were consumed prior to that, you're gaining the weight back. But now, actually, you're gaining more fat back because you have less muscle. So, therefore, overall, you are in the worst place than you were before you started the diet. So, therefore, one very important, crucial learning from this study is that you're losing weight, you're losing fat, and you're maintaining your muscle mass. The next study I picked actually is a 12-week study, and uh, 12 weeks on a weight loss, meaning uh, subjects actually asked to reduce the caloric intake by 500 calories. The reason why I actually picked this study is because after the weight loss period, uh, the subjects were also monitored for the next six months, and there was no calorie restriction, meaning they were asked to live wherever they want to live, no need to restrict calories. And the study was looking at basically, can you A, lose uh, weight uh, during the calorie restriction with phase one, meaning more weight than you would do without, but also what happens after you stop your diet? Can basically phase two help you to maintain the weight that you've lost, meaning you maintain the weight, weight loss? The outcome of the study actually is that the subjects that took phase two lost an average of five pounds more than the people on placebo after 12 weeks. So you're adding, adding five more pounds to your weight loss. Again, most of the weight loss comes from body fat. So the subject lost 3.5 pounds of body fat, and they again improved their body composition. Very important from the, the maintenance uh, phase, the six months after the study, when people actually ate normal again, so no calorie restriction, three quarters of the people successfully maintained their body weight. So they lost it, but then actually they kept the weight up. And that is really, really, really a great result because that's what dieting is all about. You want to improve from where you are, and then you want to maintain actually your improvement. So this is a, a great study with great results. The next study I wanted to show you actually is a, a study that was done uh, again, an overweight people, and the uh, reason why I picked this study, this is an example of a study without calorie restriction and no exercise. And uh, actually, uh, the, the study was done in, in Asia and China, and the outcome was, uh, again, matching the outcome of the other studies that actually uh, the addition of phase two increased the weight loss by 3.3 pounds in just uh, 60 days. And so again, uh, phase two being very, very effective in helping people to lose weight. And we're looking at this slide. This is a, an overview of studies that actually were performed with phase two. Uh, you can actually see that with and without calorie restriction, uh, you see uh, on average always an improvement of uh, uh, body weight, meaning that if you add phase two to your diet, you will lose uh, uh, weight. And uh, just this table, the, the overwhelming amount of science that's available should make you feel confident in recommending phase two for weight loss. So why do diets fail? And one of the major reasons why diets fail is uh, you're getting in a grumpy mood because if I'm reducing calories, actually my mood uh, is getting worse and a lot of people actually become unbearable. It's uh, what's called hangry, the state of anger caused by lack of food. And uh, usually it, it, the hunger causes a negative change in the emotional state. Obviously, mood in general is an indicator for uh, food consumption because uh, uh, eating food uh, can improve your mood. So people that are in a bad mood sometimes use uh, food. As, as a treatment for for being in, in a bad mood, and then obviously uh, uh, this in the long run uh, overeating results in an increased obesity. So there's a direct link between the food intake, the mood, and the rate of obesity. So when we're looking at phase two again, this is the study that we discussed earlier: the 12 weeks of calorie restriction and the 24 weeks of maintenance dose. Actually, when we look at the, the, the outcome is that, that phase two significantly reduced food cravings. Because when you're on a calorie-restricted diet, you walk by a donut shop, shop uh, what the good chance of what's going to happen is that you go inside and grab one. Just one. One can't hurt. But actually, if you're adding phase two to uh, your diet, you don't have those cravings anymore, meaning that you don't have those cravings for sweets anymore. 
And very important, during the maintenance phase, actually, people felt happy. People felt more alert. And uh, as a result, they had less cravings. So adding phase two and you being able to manage your, your carbohydrates actually does two further things. Not only does it actually uh, result in weight loss and, 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 and fat loss, but you actually are improving your mood and you're reducing your food cravings, which obviously in the long run increases the chances of a diet to be successful. Let's take a look at accepted claims. And it's always good for uh, ingredients to actually have claims, meaning that an independent uh, um, government they took a look at your data. They look at basically what we know about the ingredient. They look at all the studies. And uh, if, if the science is strong and the results are there, then they obviously uh, allow you to uh, to make claims on your product. And in the United States, actually, phase two has two claims, uh, two structure function claims. Actually, phase two may assist in weight control when used in conjunction with a sensible diet and exercise. And phase two also may reduce the enzymatic uh, digestion of dietary starches. Same is true in Canada, actually, phase two uh, assists in weight management when used with a program of reduced intake of dietary calories and increased physical activity. We know that there are a lot of ingredients out there for weight management, and there's a lot of hype around ingredients and different diets. So therefore, it's really good to see that, obviously, there's an overwhelming amount of scientific support for an ingredient, and that actually the, uh, the scientific data was reviewed by independent agencies, and they actually granted the claims for the product. There are numerous products uh, carrying phase two uh, available around the world, uh, uh, in, in Asia, in Europe, uh, and, but also here in, in the US. And uh, phase two has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, and what you usually see with diet ingredients is that if the ingredient uh, uh, goes through life cycles, there's a huge hype around an ingredient and the people jump on it and they try it. If the product actually really, really works, They'll stick with it, and the ingredient will survive uh, and will have a long product shelf uh, life. Uh, and phase two is one of those ingredients that has been ar around for a while. However, sales are still strong, and there are a lot of products carrying phase two. And the reason is actually because it works, and consumers are actually able of, of uh, seeing the results with phase two. Well, looking at consumer studies, so the, the sponsor of this talk, uh, Pharmacam, actually. Uh, uh, did uh, some consumer studies, and they asked the question is, uh, how interested are you in trying an all-natural and non-stimulant product proven in clinical studies to promote weight loss and reduce the body's absorption of calories from starchy foods? And 25% uh, of all respondents actually said that they probably or definitely would be interested in trying the product. If you are actually uh, overweight, the number actually increases to 37%. Because obviously you have a greater need uh, for actually uh, consuming a product like that, and an amazing 45% actually who take supplements were definitely uh, probably interested in actually trying this product. Those are really really great numbers, showing that uh, there is a clear need for an ingredient like phase two. However, consumers are actually a little confused about carbs, and uh, they sometimes have problems in trying to figure out which of the product actually is very rich in starch. So one third of the time they were not able to identify the uh, correct uh, product that actually was a rich in starch. Even if they felt that the, basically from the, their own, uh, uh, own, own feelings of, of what they're eating, they basically said only 23% said, yeah, well, I can see starches. Uh, however, 83% when you're looking at the product that they're consuming actually are um, rich in starches. So th there is a difference between what they feel they're eating, what they believe they're eating, and what they are actually eating. And 65% of uh, the consumers uh, actually snacked on crackers, chips, and pretzels, so all high starch products. And also consumers are con confused about what's a good carb or whether it's a bad carb. So there's confusion about carbohydrates with consumers, and then obviously it is a huge opportunity because with more education, you obviously can educate them to, to be better with food choices, and also if they have a better understanding of carbohydrates, obviously there, there's an easier understanding of what an ingredient like phase two could do for them. 
So what would you recommend phase two? And the obvious number one reason is that people are having weight concerns, if they're overweight, because the uh, number one thing phase two does actually helps you with the loss of, of body weight and, and body fat. People then have blood sugar concerns because you're reducing the amount of glucose being absorbed. Uh, therefore, actually, you're helping people that have uh, blood sugar concerns. People that are having issues with joints, with weight-bearing joints and muscles. Because while obviously there are certain symptoms uh, like pain and inflammation, uh, most of the time the, the best way to actually help those people is by reducing their body weight. If you have less weight, you have less strain on the joints, and that actually helps you uh, uh, to live a healthier life. People with chronic stress, are a good candidate for phase two because if you're on a chronic stress, uh, you have an increased craving for sugary foods. You're trying to actually treat yourself and, 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 and basically pick up some food that makes you feel better. There are cop addicts out there, people that have to have the ice cream, uh, or people that actually go on vacation. So when you travel, when you travel, you obviously, uh, your eating habits usually change and they usually do not change for the better. And since uh, we just earlier talked about the, the cop confusion, so there are uh, a lot of, of meals and snacks out there because people don't understand actually what is rich in starch and what, what is not, what is a good carb, what is a bad carb, how much carb is in there, is it naturally in there, is it added there. So basically anyone struggling with that, the, uh, phase two is a good ingredient to basically help them help them to manage the uh, uh, increase in, in carbohydrate intake. Because it's the carbs. Uh, if you take a look here, again, uh, uh, two-thirds of the starches uh, uh, will not be absorbed if you are consuming phase two. So you can eliminate two-thirds of the calories coming from starch. So basically, enjoy a little more, absorb a little less. Uh, while it's hard, as I said, to actually uh, live a low-carb diet, phase two actually is an ingredient that allows you to, to keep your diet and actually improve uh, the outcome because you're absorbing less. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Pharmachem for uh, sponsoring uh, this talk, for actually allowing me to talk about, as I said, one of my favorite ingredients, uh, a phase two. Uh, I would like to thank you all for viewing the presentation. If you have any questions about the, the ingredient, you can actually find uh, a website and uh, an email and a phone number on this slide, allowing you to contact the people at Pharmachem to inquire and learn more about phase two. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, as a reminder, everyone, there is a question box on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in a question and uh, get an answer right now. Um, let's see, we've got a question that's come in. Is phase two safe? Uh, phase two actually is manufactured in the US from uh, non-GMO plant sources and actually has an FDA GRAS approval. And the, the FDA GRAS panel confirmed that the daily ingestion of up to 10 grams per day actually is safe. And also, the, obviously, the safety is confirmed in all the clinical studies that have been done uh, where there are actually no side effects reported. So it's, phase two is a very, very good safety profile. Okay. Um, when is the best time to take phase two, and what is the recommended dose? Uh, the optimum time to actually take phase two is at the, the first bite, meaning when you, you, you're starting uh, your, your meal, and uh, obviously a, a starchy meal, uh, preferably with eight ounces uh, of water. The optimal dose from the clinical studies is between 500 and 1500 milligram uh, per meal. Uh, the, the average dose that's usually used in the clinical studies is 1000 grams uh, prior to a meal, uh, three times a day. Okay, and um, let's see. Type your questions in to the box on the right-hand side. Any more? Okay, what forms does phase two come in and what is the most popular form? 
Uh, phase two actually comes in a lot of different formats, in tablets and capsules and, and chewables, as well as in food forms, on so sprinkles, on stick packs and baked goods or, or beverages. Uh, the, the variety of different delivery forms allows you to, to really pick the one that you feel most comfortable with and the one that is most convenient for you. For example, if you're taking uh, the product with you, if you're going to the restaurant and then you're on the go, or you're basically at home. So uh, the, the taste profile of, of phase two is, is really good, uh, allowing it to be incorporated in a lot of different uh, delivery forms. Okay. Are there any side effects of phase two? Uh, the, the clinical studies are basically showing continuously that the, at the recommended doses, uh, phase two is very safe for, for consumption. So there, there's no, uh, there are no major side effects reported in any of the clinical studies. And obviously, the, the safety profile is backed by the FDA GRAS status. So the, the FDA actually reviewed the available safety data and also concluded that actually phase two is safe up to 10 grams a day. And the recommended dose is only one gram. So actually, you can even take a significant amount more and would still be in the area of having a very, very safe product. OK. Are there any more questions while we have Dr. Yeager with us? Type them in at in the question box. OK, well, if that's, if that's it. Um, I'd like to thank you all for making the time to learn about the science of carb control for weight management and fat loss. Check back in a few days for the replay of this webinar in the retail content library at wholefoodsmagazine.com. And thank you, Dr. Yeager and Pharmachem Labs for helping us bring this important information to everyone. Have a great day.